Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us for the first ever episode of the Vault Cast, the official podcast of Vault Comics about comics and so much more. My name is Dan Crary, your intrepid host, and I'm joined by our astounding producer, Mr. Kyle Foucher, and as always, our editor in chief, the fearless leader of Vault Comics, Adrian Wassel. Adrian. Thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Now, with this first episode, we got to interview the powerhouse duo that is Tim Seeley and Jim Terry. Already worked together multiple times and have worked with Vault specifically on their series West of Sundown and are now doing the Deathstalker comic. Now, Adrian, you've already seen this interview and I just wanted to hear your thoughts. What can people look forward to in this episode? What is all the fuss about? Well, I think we've got a really killer episode. I love Jim and Tim. They're two of my favorite creators I've ever worked with. And part of the reason we brought them on for Deathstalker is that they just have like such a robust knowledge of VHS and especially of like 80s, you know, sort of B-rate movies. And so you're going to get to hear some really fun stories from each of them individually individually about that kind of history that they have with VHS and like the 80s films that made them the perfect creative team for Deathstalker. And I think that's just like a fun little part of this whole creative team is that they all love Deathstalker and movies like Deathstalker so deeply that getting to play in this sandbox is just like it's their favorite sandbox to play in. You know, like Slash was the night manager at Tower Record and Video in the 80s, which is super cool. And that's where his love for Deathstalker started. Similarly, like Jim Terry and Tim Seeley are both children of the 80s that absolutely like grew up on film like Deathstalker. So you'll get to hear from two of my favorite people. Jim is also possibly the coolest person on screen ever. He just lounges around and exudes the calmest energy. So you'll get to see some of that as well, which is part of why I love working with Jim. He crushes deadlines and every time you talk to him, it's cool as a cucumber. I couldn't have said it better myself. So buckle up if you are a VHS lover. Be kind, rewind, and sit down and listen to the first episode of The Vault Cast with Tim Seeley and Jim Terry. Tell the folks at home who you are. I'm Jim Terry. I am the illustrator on Deathstalker. I have also worked with Tim on many other projects, including West Sundown, Sundowners, Alice Cooper vs. Chaos, Vampirella. I've published a few of my own books, and I did a memoir called Come Home Indio. Yeah, that's about it for me. You lounge very comfortably. That's another important part of this. With your World Warrior posters, you look very calm, Jim. I'm Tim Seeley. I'm a writer of Deathstalker. We're going along with Jim and Slash and Steve Kosansky. And I've also done West of Sundown, Money Shot for Vault, and a whole host of other stuff. Yeah, you have, including Local Man, which I'm very excited is coming back. You can say other publishers. We won't get mad. It's all right. <laughs> Kyle, if you could just censor any time I say, mm-hmm. I could say Local Man, but if I say, mm-hmm. if you could just censor that part, that'd be great. Now, you guys, Deathstalker is one of the raddest, most insane comics I think we've ever done. We just got back from New York City Comic Con, and the number of people who walked up to the booth when they saw Deathstalker and we're like, Deathstalker's coming back? It was unreal. So I got to ask, what do you think is the staying power for that sort of type of 80s fantasy, you know, goodness? Why is that stuck around in people's imagination so much? Why is there still people clamoring for Deathstalker and things like it? I say this with the most affection possible, but those films and their box art and their logo and their title They are aimed at lowest common denominator reaction, right? These were on the shelves at a VHS store back in the 80s, and they were against a whole lot of other colorful stuff. And the idea was just like, you like tits and gore and swords and babes and dudes? Here you go. And it was just all those things always out front, never subtle. There's nothing subtle about Deathstalker. We're just using the same aesthetic and same approach that is inherent in that kind of direct-to-video sort of B-movie stuff that we're celebrating. I think that a lot of it has to do, at least for me, because I also love all that stuff, is the fact that it felt like when VHS was just coming out, it was just a free-for-all. And anybody who had enough money for a camera and film was making something. And, you know, those movies, genre films especially, seem to thrive on a sense of shoestring creativity. 
that is super charming and super enduring for me. And necessity is the mother of invention, right? So all kinds of whacking wild stuff going on because they had to do something. They didn't have any money. Either that or it was just really boring. And then, you know, one of those two you are going to get. I mean, most of the stuff on my walls here is from that era. You know, that's a very treasured time in cinema for me, that whole anything can happen type of feeling that seemed to be in those movies quite a bit. That, or like I said, just like absolute boring, foggy nonsense. <laughs> because of the time that this happened, you both mentioned video stores and VHS and like it was the king. Do you guys have any specific memories or any clear memories tied to video stores to those early VHS days? Like anything that jumps out at you like, oh, I remember when I saw that box art for the first time or I discovered this actor or saw this movie that scarred me for life. Oh, man. When I was a kid, there was a store called Pot of Gold Video. And my dad was one of the earliest people in my town to get a VHS because he was a big movie buff. But Pot of Gold Video inexplicably put the porn movies on the bottom shelf along the floor. Yeah, they put like all the sci-fi stuff and all the other stuff kind of above it. I remember I was there with my dad. He was like looking through movies. You know, he was up here like reaching probably for Deathstalker or Troll or something. And I was at foot level and I said, Dad, what's a big Tata? Because there was a movie called Big Tatas. <laughs> my dad was like, oh, you know, he didn't want to explain it. But it was just inexplicably this like Grand Avenue Wassa video store. And that for some brief moment, I think it's because they were in the beta boxes. And the beta boxes were so big that they had to be across the bottom. So indelible memory for me. And 40 years later, we got money shot. There you go. There was one of the very first video stores that we knew about was in Westmont in the suburbs here outside of Chicago. And I remember they had a catalog, all the movies that they had, and it was three pages. You know, it was just three typewritten pages of movies. And I remember scanning through it, and I don't know, I was maybe nine. It said, shitty, shitty, bang, bang. <laughs> and, you know, I showed my sister, do you see this? <laughs> you know? It was three pages, so it was maybe two and a half pages. So they had like maybe a hundred movies, you know, total. But I do remember my most treasured VHS experience, and I'm still looking for it. Not super hard because it's probably outrageously expensive, but the old clamshell VHS Road Warrior. I remember how sun faded it was. I remember all of it. You know, that was the one I rented the most all the time. Yeah, can we get this again? I'm writing this down. Christmas present for Jim. You and me both. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed that it wasn't actually shitty, shitty, bang, bang. You have to wonder, like, because it was both shitties. There must be a porn <laughs> parody called Shitty, Shitty, Bang, Bang. If there isn't, they're leaving oh. money on the table for a very you know, specific demographic. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I'm still in my nine-year-older head. What I think about that. Jim, you mentioned Road Warrior, but what are some other, you know, landmark pieces of media from this era that really stand out to either of you from this very specific VHS time? Well, you know, once we were able to figure out how to pirate movies <laughs> where, you know, you get two VHS players and, you know, everybody has one of these where they have three movies on one VHS tape. Everybody from my age remembers those three movies and how many hundreds of times you watch those three movies and they were the most random assortment of things usually, you know, because you just get them as you go. And I remember we had For Your Eyes Only and Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Zap with Scott Mayo. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That is a triple feature. I would sit through that. That's awesome. <laughs> Must have seen those three movies, you know, six dozen times in one summer. Those kind of memories and the kind of sentimental attachment you get to garbage or just like something that isn't bad. You know, for your eyes only is good. Nightmare on Elm Street too. I mean, Zapped, I'm not going to defend. But that sort of attachment that you get that I don't think I get anymore because everything is so temporary and everything is streaming and it's like I watch it and I forget about it. If I don't see it again, it will go into the dustbin. You know, that idea of being able to recite Zapped, like to say the dialogue five seconds before the characters do and ruin it for everybody else. I mean, I don't do that anymore. I mean, I wouldn't anyways, but you don't do that 
things don't stay cherished in that way. And you only cherished it because it was the only one you had. They were special treasures. It wasn't like, you know, where you have a list of a thousand things that are streaming and you can just pick whatever. That one movie that you got was the movie that you got. Tim, did you have any other treasures like that? Any specific tapes? Well, I mean, yes. And actually, Death Stalker was one of them. Adrian said, hey, we might be doing Death Stalker. I was like, you have to let me do that. Because when I was a kid, my dad was, you know, big movie buff. And so when Conan was the first movie my dad ever read, I remember it was like a huge deal. We bought the VHS. My dad saved up for months to do this. Got the VHS, went straight to Pot of Gold. He got Conan and he got, I can't remember what else, but it had just come out. And then, same as Jim, there was a tape with multiple movies on it. I think it was Death Stalker, The Barbarians, which was the Barbarian Brothers, those two guys, Kuchek and Gore <laughs> in the movie, I don't remember. And then I think it had the Masters of the Universe movie. So it was like 1987, 88. He had a theme. Yeah, right. I'm sure that was part of the plan. <laughs> Barbarian movies. But man, I just remember all these like just Sundays sitting watching those movies and like they're all arguably of a quality that maybe is not, you know, the highest, but, but we loved them. To me, like Death Stalker and Barbarians, like I always felt like you were getting away with something, which probably I was. That was not a movie for a seven, eight year old, but you just always felt like you were getting away with something. And Death Stalker specifically was so violent and sexy and racy and illogical. It just always kind of felt like you were in on something as a kid, being shown a secret language of another world or something. So that's why my affections for this project were so high, because it was so much part of that. And that's why I try to sneak in little references to movies like Conquest and Sword and the Sorcerer. And if I can get one, I'll try to throw in a moment from Barbarians of some sort, some kind of homage to Barbarians. That's Maybe not, I'll take the axe. No, I want the sword. You take the axe. We need a plated sword in there somewhere too. Yeah, the sword that shoots. Yeah. And it's like, well, why? What makes the sword better? Add a gun to it. Yeah, it shoots swords out of it. Kyle, I do have a question for you, though. Do you like horror? Yes. Do you like westerns? Yes. Do you like me? Because you're really hard to read. Jury is out. Got it. Well, maybe this will tip me from acquaintance into friendship territory. I got a recommendation for you as a fan of Westerns and horror. Have you heard of our book, West of Sundown? No, I have not. Well, you're in luck, friend. This is a collaboration between Tim Seeley and Jim Terry, much like today's episode and Death Stalker. But with the additional assist of Aaron Campbell co-writing on this one, this is a horror Western that is... I'd say from dusk till dawn, an American vampire meets the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It is like a terrifying Old West tale with the hammer horror-esque monsters. We've got a young invisible man. We've got a Frankenstein's monster. But we mostly follow Constance Derabend, the vampire who's originally from the American Southwest and has been living in New York City. And then when her home is torched and her ancestral soil is destroyed in her coffin, she has to return to the New Mexico desert in order to rejuvenate herself. If you like the hammer horror stuff, it's so good. The universal monsters, the art, you know, it's Jim Terry. You already know from Death Stalker that he goes hard and he has fun with it. Weird, it's wild. It's meticulously researched by Aaron Campbell to make sure that it accurately really reflects the West of the time. I mean, obviously not the monsters. I'm so sorry, Kyle. Monsters aren't real. I didn't want to have to be the one to tell you that, but it's just an awesome time. And I want you to read it so that we have something to talk about. And then maybe after that, we can become friends because shared interests is like a good path towards friendship. So how's about this? I'm going to say if you type in the code podcast 40 on the vault website, you can pick up these two volumes for 40% off. That's just for my friend Kyle. That's for nobody else. Nobody else use the code podcast40 on vaultcomics.com to get volumes one and two of West of Sundown for 40% off or just one volume. I understand times are tough, Kyle. I could press you to spend too much money. But yeah, I think you should check it out, especially if you're enjoying what you're seeing from Deathstalker. Go see where the magic first happened with these two at Vault. I will definitely use that code and we will discuss the friends thing. Thank you. Thanks. That's all I'm asking for is a conversation. Tim, you've gotten to work on Masters of the Universe, and you've gotten to work on Deathstalker now. Have you ever worked on Conan? No, this is terrible. As much as I like Conan, and I have like Conan comics like sitting at my desk, so clearly I do like Conan, but... I don't love it as much as the other stuff in part because it's not as flexible, I guess, to me. It has more rules, whereas like, you know, I mean, I'm sure I would like to do it. But like Master Universe is this big, crazy, unlimited. Things are illogical. There's a guy who has named Too Bad. Who cares? It was just doing that. Whereas Conan is a little more, I don't want to say realistic, but the vibe is a little bit 
you know, respectful, I guess. And I think my style is to take a shit on everything to somebody, <laughs> right? Like a lovely shit, like an affectionate <laughs> shit. Absolutely. Put down some poopery first, like, you know, with all the love in the world. That's what, like, the Death Stalker thing is just, we get to make fun of him. I mean, a lot. Like, we're adding heart to it and stuff, but, like, yeah, Death Stalker is kind of a loser. And I love it. I think that's so much fun. So what's it been like having that sort of irreverence for the character, having that sort of freedom? What's been the working relationship like? Jim and I come into this with respect for the guys that are working on us, mostly with Slash. Slash is like, that's cool. That's cool. If we're making Slash happy, we're all doing well. Can confirm in emails and on Slack. A lot of, that's cool, or this is awesome, or how badass is that? Jim, what's it like to see Slash, like, freak out over your art? I don't picture Slash freaking out. Are you reading the same emails that I'm reading? Are you seeing the same Slacks? But this is awesome. This is so sick. My version of freaking out is different than Slash's, you know, <laughs> he's super chill, but it is wild. And it was very strange to hear Slash say my name on the Kickstarter campaign. I was like, wait, what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's super cool. And I really love the fact that he's excited about this. That's very encouraging to me. I've worked in other situations where people didn't have a passion for what they were doing. You know, it was just a job or, or just an investment. So for him to be genuinely involved and emotionally attached to it, it means a lot to me too. It makes me want to do even better. It makes me want to go that extra mile for it. It feels like everybody involved with this, I don't know, raised their hand and was like, oh, I love Deathstalker. Can I please be a part of Deathstalker? I don't think we have anyone working on this book who isn't a fan before anything else that they're doing. I mean, there probably would be no other reason to do it if only because it's not as well known as Conan. I mean, it's known for a very sort of specific age group and a kind of person, which is weirdos like us. But I think part of our job then is to be like, let's show our enthusiasm to a wider audience who may not be familiar with it. And, you know, I teach at a college and so a lot of my students be like, what are you working on? One of my students went back and watched the movie and never seen it. And he was like, what the hell? How did I not know about this? I feel like if that's what we do, if we get sort of, you know, the enthusiasm for this new project, if it gets people going back and checking out those original movies, especially Death Stalker 2, which is my favorite one, then we'll have done a good job. Of course, it's your favorite one. It's the best one. <laughs> Probably the most entertaining. Yeah, no Death Stalker 2 slander. I like the sincerity of the first one. It is very Tim and I work, you know, because he likes to challenge everything. I'm way too sincere. I'm way too sincere in everything that I do. So it's nice to be pushed to a little bit of satire. Jim, I adore your sincerity. That panel that we had at ALA, you were just like putting your heart out there. I love it. That's one of my favorite things about you. Don't lose that sincerity, please. All right. Let me be the dick. I'll be the dick. You be the good guy. Hey, I'm Slash. You probably know me as a musician, but back in the early 80s, I was the night shift manager at Tower Video. I remember when the first Death Stalker movie came out. It was awesome. It had massive swords, hot women, you know, gigantic monsters, and just all that great sort of 80s kind of vibe to it, which is why I'm so excited to tell you we're bringing Death Stalker back. Together with Vault Comics and the team of Tim Seeley, Jim Terry, Stephen Kostansky, Nathan Gooden, and the original movie poster artist Boris Vallejo, we're bringing you an all-new Deathstalker graphic novel. The story is wild and hilarious, and the art is fucking fantastic. This book mixes the nostalgia of the 80s, but with a bit more modern humor. We want to make a whole variety of incredible hardcover books, so join us in bringing this new epic vision of Deathstalker to life. The more support we get, the cooler the books are going to be. So check it out. You're going to love it. So we're getting a sense of this dynamic here between the two of you. I mean, obviously, you'd worked together before on West of Sundown. What's it like retooling? Like, what's different from the first time you guys worked together versus this time? Well, Jim and I know each other in the real world. We both live in Chicago. We're only miles apart at this very moment. So we've been hanging out for, is it like 12 or 13 years, Jim? Around there, yeah. But we didn't really like do comics together right away, but we kind of figured out we did a uh, book for Dark Horse together. Our dynamic is usually that I know Jim can write and draw. So my first time I worked with him, I overdid it. I gave him too much. He doesn't need too much because he can write, he can create something. I give him what the story needs and then he draws the shit out of it and I give him the dialogue that will go wherever. And I think it's more like a, not quite the Marvel system where it's, I can be more trustful of Jim's stuff than I can just in general in comics because I just know how he works. I know what he's going to draw most of the time and I know he doesn't need me to tell him too much. 
Yeah. And for me, the dynamic has been a little different each time, you know, because we've developed as co-workers. But West of Sundown, Aaron Campbell was coming up with ideas as well, you know, so that added something to the stew. And on this one, you know, it's an IP and there are other things to be considerate of while you're working through it. And that adds a different dynamic and things that you have to take care of and address in the story, involved in the story. So, you know, it's been a little bit different each time. But Tim is one of my favorite people in the world because he is so unlike me. I take everything really personally and my feelings are like a wet cardboard, you know, so easily ripped to shreds. But Tim, things just bounce off of him most of the time. And he knows I'm never trying to be a dick. I can be like, what the hell is going on here? What is on this page? I don't understand. Oh, yeah, it's this. I'm like, okay. And so, you know, being friends is super helpful. Turning somebody's words into illustrations is hard. Getting a script and saying, how am I going to fit all this on a page? That can be frustrating sometimes. My favorite thing about working with Tim is that his attitude is so professional and laid back as well that I feel like I can be this sort of, you know, spastic psycho once in a while without going overboard or without completely losing sight of what's important. I don't know. I just really value that. Now, Jim, you mentioned you're working on an IP. Is this your first licensed work? I've worked on, you know, like Vampirella and, you know, and there's Alice Cooper and there's Chaos. I worked for Marvel. I understand the nature of having to stick to things, you know, and certain things being essential to what you're doing. Even though as an artist, it feels like it's getting in the way of what you're trying to do. It's like, no, we need this. As a comic book artist, you just have to go with the flow on that. And hopefully it's organic enough into the story that it, none of it feels forced. And, you know, that's part of the thing about trying to be creative with stuff. You're handed these limitations or you know, things that you have to do. And hopefully you can do it creatively and make it fun and seem like that's what you always intend. Almost like a puzzle, sort of a fun, fun thing to try and figure out. Like, how does this compare creatively to, you know, other IP that you've worked on? Like, you know, Tim, I know you've done a lot of work on like Masters of the Universe and Nightwing and stuff. It's got to be a pretty different experience from property to property as to like editorial involvement, what kind of parameters you're given. How does Deathstalker compare to some of those other projects? as far as number of limitations or just what that working relationship within those limitations has been like. So something like Nightwing or Master of the Universe have rules and they have established stories and they have continuity. And to some degree, that's your job. And you know, it's your job. You have to follow the mechanics of how this works and the things that the fans want to reference. And the weird thing about Deathstalker is there are four movies and they appear to be unrelated pretty much, except for the fact when they, that they reuse footage sometimes, which is just part of the movies, which they did in the second one and the third and the fourth one. There doesn't seem to be like well, a universe, really a world established. You know, there's no map of like where they are. The second one is a farce. The third one is a swashbuckler movie. The fourth one, I mean, they're all drastically different. And so the lack of rules is the rule for Deathstalker, <laughs> right? So, and that's a big part of what Steve wanted too, that part of the experience sort of be like, wait, but that's the guy from what he wanted it to feel sort of like the movies do. And it's something that we put in there. Sometimes part of these like fantasy movies from that era was kind of the what the fuck of it all, where you would kind of be like, why? But that was kind of part of the fun that you were kind of mystified and didn't understand the decision. And, you know, this almost disconnected experience was sort of part of the joy. So that's the only kind of rule that we have here is, you know, if we're going to reference stuff and we do reference the other movie, but part of it has to be a little bit off kilter. So in working in that kind of environment where the only rule is there are no rules, what's been the biggest surprise along the way? The biggest what the fuck moment so far? We reference the second movie quite a bit and bring back the character Evie, who is played by Monique Gabriel in the second movie. And just like the way I remember that character as being kind of like a strong female protagonist. And then I wrote it and then I went back and watched it. I was like, oh, no, she's really charming in that movie. But she's definitely sort of not, you know, I don't think she passed the Bechdel test in that. So one of the things that we wanted to do in this was like, well, let's keep that. Let's keep that idea that you know, she's kind of the spurned lover, but she's also sort of like, why did I care about that guy in the first place? He sucked. And she has a pretty big role in the story, actually, that I really like how we use her. And she shows up in the first and second issue. Jim, have there been any, like, what the fuck moment, major surprises for you? The rhino butt. <laughs> <laughs> no further explanation needed. If you want to know what he's talking about, you got to pick up the book. But I was like, okay. It makes sense. It's armored all over, Jim. Where are we going to stab him? <laughs> Hey, I'm all in, man. I'm all in. 
Jim, I love how earnestly sincere you are with that. You're not wrong. Where else are you going to stab a rhinoceros? I knew this was going to be fun. These guys, this is the first episode. It has to be these guys. Outside of the films themselves, were there any specific models or references you were looking at, Jim, for character design? Because you've done some fucking rad character design in this book. So I was just curious as to where you were looking as far as modeling and inspiration goes. Honestly, I think it's just all drawing from the mental belief in my head from that era, from the movies of that era. I mean, Deathstalker definitely has, you know, a little bit of Road Warrior flair to him. A lot of the villains and the people that I'm drawing in the background, I mean, some of them I'm thinking of Excalibur and the way that the armor looks in Excalibur, you know, with that John Borman type of shine to it and that 80s gel lens that they were using. And I was thinking of that, you know, and of course, Conan and all the movies that Tim has referenced and a bit of Terry Gilliam as well, especially from that era, you know, Time Bandits, Brazil. Those movies were huge for me as a youngster. I think that they've influenced me more than I actually give them credit for. And especially with this in Time Bandits, when they go into the land of fantasy and just that general grimy, filthy feel to everything, that's very much what I've been thinking of. And the quirkiness of it all, you know, like it's quirky, but it's weirdly practical. So... Yeah, just kind of pulling on all those things floating around in my memory. Aside from the very specific stuff that needs to be looked at and addressed and, you know, like, well, okay, so what kind of armor do they have? You know, that's too fancy. That looks like a robot. But hopefully just trying to give everybody, each kingdom, each type of person, a practical but specific look. So while it's Deathstalker in name, really, when you look at the influences, this thing's just a love letter to 80s VHS cinema. Oh, for me, 100%. Yeah. That's awesome. There's your pitch, folks. If you like a single VHS from the 1980s, you're going to like this book. If you like a VHS from... <laughs> this is nothing like Moonstruck. Maybe it's a tape of your grandma's bar mitzvah or whatever. We're going to make sure that you enjoy the scene. Right? I want to see grandma's bat mitzvah that was available on VHS. <laughs> Too, they said, like, that doesn't make sense. There's probably some grandmas who had bat mitzvahs in the 80s. The time lines up, Tim. You're not too far afield. There you go. So, Tim, obviously, you're so old hat at just playing in other people's sandboxes at this point, having this kind of freedom, does this really feel like an IP at all? Or does this almost feel like a creator-owned book? What you're describing process-wise and like the level of creative control and freedom that you have, has that been kind of, I don't want to say liberating? You get to write your own stuff all the time. But it's obviously a different feel almost completely than some of that other stuff. Yeah, for sure. The thing I'm trying to keep in mind on this one is not do I please the licensors or something? Because I feel like now I have a pretty good understanding and we're all on the same page. But how do I make this appeal to modern readers? I think that's the overwhelming parameters that are in my head. It can't just be you know strictly a love letter. It has to be adding something new, which I think we're really trying to push here as well. And it also has to sort of take an account to what's different now, which you know, in 30, 40 years since the first Death Star, you're like, times have changed. And there are things in those movies that are not appropriate at all for anyone. So, I mean, I think, you know, like part of it has to be paying as much sort of homage and sincerity to the original material, but also figuring out how this is relevant now. I know Sword and Sorcery still has a place. Vault has had several years of big hits with Barbaric. So I know that there are audience for it. I know there are people that are looking for sort of new takes on the sword and sandals. So that's the challenge and the parameter of which I feel like is most pressed upon me by myself, probably more than anybody else. So as you've been considering that, who do you think is going to love this? As that's been your guiding principle of like modern audience, we got to find new people. Who do you think is going to be a fan of Deathstalker? Everything I make, my hope is everybody loves it. I know that's so naive to think that because it's impossible. I always go into my books being like, this is for everyone. Money shot. I'm like, everybody who reads this will love it. It's like, no, those hardcore evangelicals are not going to love the same way idiot. But I do always go into it thinking that. I feel like if you've been reading the Vault books and you like that Vault is really good at doing these very specific genres of sci-fi, horror, and fantasy as well as they do, I feel like this has to be one of those. So I'm trying to make a very good Vault book for the very good Vault audience. Your own creator-owned amazing series Hackslash has had many crossovers over the years. Is there a pitch, Tim, for a Hackslash Deathstalker crossover? It'd be so easy. I mean, it would be so easy. I don't have to spend any time on it. I could go downstairs, grab a beer. I'd have a story for you by the time I came back. The Hackslash is by design very flexible, and it exists in its own 80s VHS universe anyway. So clearly, there'd be an easy way to go. 
And then the big thing would be that Cassie would just find him the worst. And she wouldn't take any shit like the rest of the people in his world do so. It would be great. I would love to do that stuff. I think that would be so much fun. Or we could do hack slash versus slash. Hack slash versus slash? Don't threaten me with a good time, Tim. And it could be like Vlad is out of the scene and Cassie has to team up with Slash and they take on ghosts like Scooby-Doo and like whatever weird guest star was, you know, Don Rickles or whatever. I got to throw a couple other like hack slash crossovers at you now. Let's see. Okay, you're wearing the crow shirt. What's the hack slash crow crossover? You did it. Jim drew it. It's all shit. You're right. I'm insane. (laughs) The list of things you haven't crossed over with has got to be getting shorter every day. Right. That's killer, dude. You're one of the busiest people in comics. I know in the past you've had your schedule like on a whiteboard. Is that still the case? Yes. It is nailed into the wall staring at me horrifically. Well, I couldn't show you because it has secret shit on it. But Oh, okay. That's fair. All right. I respect it. But having seen the whiteboard myself on a previous call, it is... It is dastardly. Inspiring and intimidating at the same time. I'm like, I don't know when you sleep, man. Part of it is I feel like if I stop making shit, I'll just die. So that's probably not a good way to do anything. But that's how I've been doing it for the past 20 years. So we can see we're in your incredible office, which is one of my favorite offices in comics. Incredibly well curated. Now, aside from the whiteboard, I have to ask, like, what's the prize of the collection there? You have the spinner racks. You've got the posters. You got so many cool things on display there. But like the house is on fire. What do you have to grab with you on your way out? I mean... There's lots of cool stuff. There is the Spider-Man statue my dad painted for me when I was a kid. Let's see, the zombie dust label I did. There's the beer topper. All kinds of cool stuff. Uh, I would say when my cat died, I got a plaster cast of her paw, and it's right there. So I would grab that. I'd save that over uh, Biotron. But, you know, it's the land of little memories here, all kinds of stuff. And it needs a good dusting. That's a good answer. That's a solid answer. Now, Jim, you don't work out of your home, right? You have a studio space. I do have a studio space, but I have been working out of my home most of the time lately. Oh, okay. What's your setup like? I sit on the couch and draw. It's very impromptu. You know, I do go into the studio whenever I'm working on something traditional. I have my drawing table there and everything. It's just when I get into a mode and with this book, there's a lot involved in this book as far as drawing it. So... You know, going to the studio and catching up with the guys and then, you know, going out to lunch and, you know, catching up on what we've seen and what we've been reading. I'm just not as productive. So now I suffer through the isolation, just sitting at home with music. We'll be on in the background or, you know, something I don't have to pay too much attention to and just crank through it, you know. It's a long work day. And so by the end of the day, I'm grateful that I have the kind of, you know, social sphere where I can do something at the end of the day, meet up with people or go see my girlfriend or whatever it is. Because, you know, too long in this head on its own, I should go to the studio more often just so I don't go full Jack Torrance. All work and no play makes Jim a dull boy, obviously. What's the typical day like since you've been at home, just as far as like busting out pages? Are you just waking up? cup of coffee on the couch. What's a working day like for you? Yeah, that's pretty much it. When I was in the pencil stage, my goal was five pages pencils a day. And those are very loose pencils, you know, and thankfully after you turn in enough pencils and inks, they say, okay, I see what he's doing with the pencils and I don't have to go as detailed with them after the first, you know, maybe 10, 15 pages of those. And then I can get a little looser because I do work primarily in the inks. So yeah, trying to do five pencil pages a day. And then when I'm in the inking stage, I'm trying to get two a day done or between four and 12 hours, anywhere in between there. So You know, sometimes I have things during the day that I got to take care of. But for the most part, it's just sit down and start trucking. Damn. With that kind of output, I'm sure there's a lot to choose from. But Tim, what has been, not to be your favorite, but what's been one of the coolest pieces you've seen Jim produce for this project as he's just been blasting through pages? Oh, the double page spread. The double page spread. I never write double page spread. I generally think unless you're Jack Kirby, they're a waste of comic space. But I knew if I gave Jim a good Conan style hack em up double page spread, he would nail it. And it's awesome. It's like Jack Davis, John Basema, you know, madness going on. It's great shit. And the sort of grittiness of it, one of the things that we have in here is that they're being pursued by these cultists that don't bathe because they are waiting to bathe in the bathwater of their goddess. And so they're just like these gritty, gross, oil infected people. And man, it's great. Oh, God. That's a choice. I can't wait to see the cosplay that results from that. Oh, yeah. There's definitely some people at shows that could just take out their clothes and they'd be there. They'd have the costume. Half of them are behind the tables. (laughs) (laughs) It's a nice shirt you got there, Dan. 
oh, this old thing? Thank you. I got it from my friends at Bat City Comics Professionals. Check it out. Bat City Comics Professionals is a 501c3 nonprofit comic book store located in Bradenton, Florida, building the next generation of superheroes through comics education. These people are some of my favorite folks in comics. Aside from just sending me lovely shirts, they are doing incredible work in their community. They offer new release comics with a heavy focus on Indian small press. They call her Small Press Shannon for a reason. Shannon Live and her husband Matt own the place and they are killing it. They have paperback and hardcover collections, manga, kids and teen graphic novels, picture books for every reader level, key collection comics. They also have grading services available, including like pressings and cleanings and stuff. And over 300,000 backstock comics, which are all in the dollar to $2 range. As a nonprofit, Bat City Comics teaches reading, writing, and imagination skills to young people. They have a partnership with area schools and libraries, the Boys and Girls Club, the Girl Scouts of America, the Boy Scouts, Patterson Foundation, and the Sun Coast Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Through these partnerships, they've developed a curriculum to help students improve their reading and writing skills through imaginative and collaborative comic book education. They also offer free programs in the store, create your own comic workshops where kids can learn the elements of writing through through dual-coded learning processes that ends with them creating their own comic. They have an academic Avengers program, which is a large-scale activities that allows families to learn and work together while having fun with learning. They also offer a ton of programming for adults, such as ladies and non-binary nerd night meetups, a $1 book club where books never cost more than a dollar. So it provides an awesome chance for people who are willing to take a chance on a book. They do creator meetups. And additionally, they work to promote indie and small press books through their weekly Wind Down Your Weekend series, where they highlight all of that week's new Indian small press releases while drinking a bottle of wine. It is one of my favorite things to watch. Shannon is a goddess, does an amazing job with it. So if you're in the Bradenton area, come check out our friends at Bat City Comics, Shannon and Matt. They are really doing an incredible job creating the next generation of comics fans. Go in there and tell them that Dan from Vault says hi. This book is obviously running on Kickstarter first, and then there'll be single issues out in shops later next year. Looking at the campaign, has there been anything in any of the specific tiers that you guys have seen where you're like, ooh, that version or that item, that's pretty cool. I mean, those Tim Daniel design box set stuff, it's so good looking. I mean, it's the sort of Cadillac approach to the design on this thing and using like divorce Vallejo art and new ways stuff, man. I'm hoping I just get a truck backed up to my house at some point with the comp of all this stuff. And it's just all those box sets and card covers and stuff. So it is one of the best looking things I've worked on. I mean, just it's clear that Tim is having a real good time with the design of that stuff. He always does a good job, but when you give him something that he clearly also was a weird basement dwelling VHS kid for, that uh, he's really excited about. It. Is there anything on the Kickstarter that's jumped out at you, Jim? I haven't looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> You're cranking out five pages a day. What do you got time to look at it for? <laughs> I assume I'll see it sooner or later. Well, don't listen to Tim. There's only like two versions. We're going to send a pallet to Seely's house. I'll just come over. I'll grab some Tim stuff and steal that Blade Runner poster. <laughs> Well, what's the story about the Blade Runner poster? You know, those like print companies like Mondo and stuff, you know, that do mm -hmm. like limited edition. There was this Blade Runner release that they did, which was like half the original movie and then half 2049, you know? And so my wife and I were like, we have to get that for Jim. It's so cool. So we bought it because his birthday was coming up. And then we had finally finished off our basement and then the house we moved into. And we got the print and we opened it up and we're like, we can't give this to Jim. It's so great. It fits our house too well. <laughs> And we hung it up, and then when Jim came over, he said, that's great. We're like, yeah, it was supposed to be for you, but we kept it. Why tell me that? Cruelty was the point. He could have got his whole life without knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> I felt guilty about it, and I still do, but we really put the room together. Well, don't feel too bad. I know for a fact that, Jim, you have some pretty incredible treasures yourself. I'm thinking specifically of maybe a book that you may have picked up in France with something pretty incredible inside it. I do original Mobius art in my home right now, which is, you know, after the cats, maybe I would grab that. That's probably worth going back for. Yeah. And that would add to the tail. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Pretty incredible stuff. All right, guys, I wanted to ask you if you could describe Deathstalker, the comic that you're working on in one word, what would that word be? I heard somebody describe it because it's with Slash as metal. So I'm going to go with metal. It's very metal. Yeah. Metal's pretty good. I was thinking just wild. 
It's a wild book. That is also true. You'll see some things in there that you weren't expecting, probably. Jim Terry, Tim Seeley, thank you so much for being our guests here on this inaugural podcast episode. Be sure to go check out the Death Stalker Kickstarter, which is live right now. You can get your hands on one of these gorgeous editions before they all end up at Tim Seeley's house. And keep an eye out for the single issues coming out in the spring. Before we go, Jim, Tim, is there anything else you guys are working on you want to draw people's attention to? I mean, I've already professed my love for Local Man, worthy of another shout out, but anything you guys are working on? The Minor Threats, The Alternates, which is a series I'm doing with uh, Pat Oswald, Jordan Bloom, Chris Mitten. It's a sequel to their Minor Threats series from Dark Horse. I'm very proud of it. Issue 2 just came out last week. I think it's one of the best things I've ever written, so check that one out. And I'm working on something in conjunction with the Newberry Library here in Chicago that is more along the lines of the Come Home Indio stuff that is going to be an examination of my time spent there reading their Ayers collection, which has to do with a massive collection of indigenous books about indigenous people by, you know, non-indigenous people, but anything having to do with natives here. And it's going to be an exploration of what that was like. That will be collected in a comic. That will be probably in about a year. But that's the next thing that's on my slate right after this. For anyone listening who hasn't picked up Come Home Indio, it's a stellar, stellar read. I mean that, Jim. You got to check it out. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us, guys. And that's our show. Great job, Kyle. One in the books. I did it. You did it. You're a hero. The Vault Cast is produced by Kyle Foucher and Daniel Crary, hosted by your man, Daniel Crary. We have social media support by Britta Bisher, logo design by Tim Daniels. The Vault Cast is a copyrighted production of Vault Comics, copyright 2023. Join us for our next episode where our guest will be Ben Hennessy, your new favorite comic book artist. Ben is wrapping up his series Godfell with us, and we'll be discussing that, his background in animation, all things Ireland, and so much more. So you're not going to miss it. Make sure you tune in two weeks for the next episode of The Vault Cast. Until then, I'm Dan, that's Kyle, and we will see you next time.